this episode, I want to give an overview of the advanced user interface. It's far too complex to give a detailed description in one tutorial, but I hope to give enough detail to enable you to create a basic title. In future episodes, I hope to cover the many features of Title Studio, although in some episodes I may only be able to deal with one feature, depending upon the complexity of that feature. Be aware that I'm using Title Studio within Continuum version 2021.5. Your version's UI may be slightly different. Another couple of things to note. There are parts of the normal workflow where certain sequences of actions will cause the application to crash. At these points in the tutorial, I'll describe these actions so they can be avoided. I'll also describe any available workarounds. You also need to be aware that some interaction with objects in the workspace can be a little tricky. You'll see what I mean by that when they're encountered. Welcome to my 50 second tutorial. At the top of the UI is the main menu bar. The options in this bar are so numerous I need to deal with these as and when they are required. The advanced user interface by default basically consists of three windows, all movable and all dockable. I explained how to move and dock windows in episode 2. Three windows are the controls or text window, the composite window, and the timeline window. There is another window, the tools window, which can be hidden, but it can't be moved. It is docked to the composite window. Before describing the windows, I want to talk briefly about the default dark UI color scheme. It's so bad that there are some parts of it that are virtually invisible. For instance, the icons that allow windows to be hidden are only revealed when the mouse pointer is over them. I've done a lot of experimenting with the various element colours and I've arrived at what I think is a reasonable compromise. You may think differently but I'll describe the procedure so that you can experiment if you so desire. To change the colour scheme, go to Edit on the main menu bar and select Preferences. A dialog box opens showing many options. The one to concentrate on just now is the Colours option. Click the text colour box and choose White. and click OK. Click the Windows colour box and enter the following values for Hue, Saturation and Luminance. 160, 0 and 99. Click OK, then OK again. Note that the changing colour will take place when windows are selected. You can now see that the icons for hiding windows are clearly visible. This colour scheme will also be applied to the FX Browser UI. The Controls or Text window this window has, by default, two tabs at its top, Controls and Text. The Controls tab. Selecting this tab opens the Controls window. This window is contextual, so the type of controls displayed will depend upon the object or group of objects selected. The Text tab. Selecting this tab opens the text window, which displays the currently selected text object 
and its attributes. This is where you can use the many attribute controls to change the way your text string appears. You can also edit the text string here, although doing so may cause the application to crash. I'll describe a workaround for this later. The composite window. This window displays a composite view of all the objects in the project. It has three sections. Preview controls, playback controls and preview window. Preview controls. This section contains controls that determine the way title elements are displayed in the preview window. It also displays various information. I'll deal with this section starting from the left. The zoom scale. This value displays the preview window resolution as a percentage of the project resolution. Left clicking this value will open up a list of percentage values. In this case, changing the size of the preview window with the size in handles won't change the resolution of the display. If you select fit or fit to 100%, the percentage value will change if the window is resized. This ensures that the title fits the preview window irrespective of its size. The change preview resolution icon simply determines how much detail is displayed Having a lower preview resolution can improve playback performance. Change preview channels. This drop down list allows the individual colour channels of the title to be displayed. Unless you're familiar with colour theory, I suggest that you leave this at the default RGB setting. The next icon drop down displays three options. Composite over colour will display the title over a coloured background and is the default setting. This colour is determined by the background colour setting in preferences. Composite over checkerboard simply displays the title over an alpha channel background. Composite over background will display the title composited with the NLE event that has the title studio effect applied. Note that if the title studio effect has been applied to an empty event, as described in episode 1, the background will be black. The next icon drop down allows various on screen controls to be displayed or hidden. Title Safe displays various guidelines to help you place your title elements. Grid places a coloured grid onto the display which can help to accurately place objects. Rulers and Guides. This is the default setting and places rulers at the top and left side of the display. It also allows guides to be dragged onto the display, which can help when placing objects, although placing these guides is a bit fiddly.
While I'm talking about guides, you should be aware that currently, that's the 29th of November 2021, there's a bug that crashes the UI if a spline object is created whilst the guide is on the display. For that reason, you should not use guides while creating or working with spline objects. I'll be dealing with spline objects in a future tutorial. The fourth option removes any guides that have been created. The next icon drop down toggles camera views. Camera views help when creating a 3D environment. For now, this should be left at the default setting, which is render camera. The final drop down icon reveals a list of possible preview layouts. An appropriate layout can help when creating a 3D environment. The next three parameters display the following values. T gives the relative time at the playhead. For future reference, Boris FX documentation refers to the playhead as the current time indicator, or CTI for short. For continuity, I'll use this abbreviation when referring to the playhead. K gives the relative time at the selected keyframe. Selected keyframes are red. D gives the duration of the event that the title is being applied to. Playback controls. At the centre are several transport controls, which are fairly straightforward. Hovering the mouse over a control icon will display a label indicating its function. At the left hand side there are four icons relating to keyframe animation. The leftmost icon toggles keyframe activity. In its active mode, that is when its colour is red, any change made to the selected object will automatically create a keyframe on the object's timeline track. In its default inactive mode, keyframes aren't automatically created but they can be manually created. The next icon, if clicked, will return the CTI to the previous keyframe on the selected track, that is, where the track is blue. Note that there is always a keyframe at the start of the track. Icon number three, when clicked, will create a keyframe at the current CTI position on the selected track. The fourth icon, when clicked, will move the CTI to the next keyframe on the selected track. Again, note that there is always a keyframe at the end of the selected track. I'll be dealing with keyframe animation in a future tutorial. At the right hand side there are two icons with drop down arrows. The first icon allows the preview quality to be changed. There are two settings draft and high. Depending upon your system, better playback may be achieved by selecting draft. The second icon also has two settings, time accurate and frame accurate. In time accurate mode, the preview will skip frames in order to play as close to real time as possible. Frame accurate mode will drop performance to ensure that every frame is displayed during playback. Tools. In its default mode, the tool strip has 13 tools. I say default mode because the strip is contextual and will be different when drawing shapes. More on this later. In default mode, starting at the top, the tools are the arrow tool, this enables the selection of objects in the display area.
the magnify tool does what it says. Left clicking in the display will zoom in. Alt left click will zoom out. Each click doubles or halves the magnification percentage. Shift left click will return the magnification to its default value. In addition to this, the mouse scroll wheel allows zooming in or out to the centre of the display, whichever tool is selected. The hand tool. Use this tool to move the workspace around the display area. This is useful if you are working at a high magnification. Note that you can move the workspace around when any other tool is selected by holding the spacebar down. The next two tools toggle camera views and toggle light views. I want to leave that for another tutorial. Selecting the Translate Interactor tool will display on-screen controls for the selected object. These controls enable movement of the object in 3D space. They turn yellow when the mouse is hovered over them, indicating that they can be moved. The red and green arrows allow movement in the X and Y planes. The blue dot is an arrow pointing out of the display. That allows movements in the Z plane or Z plane. Note that the square at the junction of the arrows will turn yellow when the mouse is hovered over it. You can left click in this square and drag the object freely within the display. The Scale Interactor tool displays on-screen controls for the selected object. Scaling of the object is achieved using these controls. Note the difference between these controls and the one for the Translate Interactor tool. The green control allows the object to be scaled in the Y plane. The red control allows scaling in the X plane. The blue control allows scaling in the Z plane. Note that scaling for text in the Z plane is only possible if the text is extruded, as this is. As with the Translate Interactor, the square at the junction of the arrows will turn yellow when the mouse is hovered over it. You can left click in this square and scale the object freely. The Rotate Interactor tool displays a semi-transparent globe for the selected object. Clicking and dragging inside this globe allows coarse rotational control of the object. As you can see, using this control is rather tricky. For more precise control, it's best to use the rotation controls in the controls window.
The circumference of the globe is colour-coded, which gives a visual representation of the rotational position. The next four tools are used for creating shapes, but I won't be going into detail about these tools here. The final tool is the text tool. Selecting this and clicking in the composite window will create a new text object for the scene. You won't be aware from the display that a new text object has been created, but if you start typing you will see the text. Now I mentioned that the tool strip was contextual. This means that the content changes depending upon the current object selected. For instance, if you select the rectangle tool and draw a rectangle, you'll see that the tool strip changes. I'm going to leave the function of these extra tools for another tutorial. The Timeline window. This window is in two sections. The Timeline Controls section. This contains a number of entries for each object in the project. Each entry can be opened up to display controls for the selected object. The controls available will be dependent upon the type of object selected. The window also contains icons that allow the timeline view to be modified and to add various elements to the project. The global timeline. This section contains all the tracks that correspond to the various entries displayed in the Timeline Controls section. A highlighted track corresponds to a highlighted entry in the Timeline Controls section. The Timeline window is complex, so I'm going to leave the detail for another tutorial. Now that's the user interface dealt with, albeit briefly. Now let's create a title from scratch. We'll start with a blank canvas. There are many ways to do this, but probably the easiest way is to select the top entry in the Timeline Controls section and then press Delete. This will remove all objects from the project. To start creating the title, we'll enter some text. To do this we need to be in text mode, so select the text tool from the toolbar. When selected it's highlighted in blue. Next click in the composite workspace. This will open up all the text parameters underneath the window in the controls and text workspace. You will also see that the timeline control section has been populated with entries for the proposed text object. It won't necessarily be obvious from the composite window that you're in text input mode, as there may not be a flashing cursor. Type your text string, either in the composite window or the text window. Be aware if you type your text string in the text window, the initial character strangely appears at the end of the text string. I've reported this to Boris FX. The string can be modified by clicking and dragging across the text, which will select it. If you need to edit the text, do so in the composite window. Do not try editing the text using the text window. If you do, Title Studio will crash immediately. I have also reported this to Boris FX, who have confirmed the bug. There is a workaround which will prevent a crash. If you want to edit the text in the text window, make sure that you first select the arrow tool before attempting to change the text.
Clicking on the font name parameter in the text window displays all installed fonts and allows the title font to be changed. At the side of the font name parameter there are two arrows, one pointing up and one pointing down. Clicking these buttons will step through the font list downwards or upwards. Note that for a change of font to work, the text string or part of it to be modified needs to be selected. Note also that the change will only be applied to the text in the text window. To update the text in the composite window, you need to click the apply button. There is an auto update checkbox that if checked should ensure that the text in the composite window is updated automatically whenever a text parameter is changed. But this is not always the case. For instance, changing the font using the font drop down list will update automatically, but changing it using the font size arrows doesn't. Clicking in the point size parameter box allows the point size to be changed by typing in a new size. To the right of this box there are two buttons. The left hand one will reduce the point size in steps of 10. The right hand button will increase the point size in steps of 10. The text by default will usually be extruded. If you don't want extruded text, you should first select the text, then click on the Change Track Shape button. This button sits at the side of the eye icon for the selected entry in the Timeline Control section. In this case it isn't extruded text, so I'll select Extrusion. Now to finish off the title, you may want to give it a background. To do this, select the top entry in the Timeline control section, then click the Add New Media icon. This will reveal several options. For now I'm going to select Gradient. You'll find that the Gradient, which is monochrome by default, obscures the title. This is because the entry in the Timeline control section is above the title entry. To correct this, Grab the gradient entry and pull it down to the bottom, underneath the title entry. To change the gradient, select the texture entry for the gradient and select the controls window. This will show the properties for the gradient. I won't go into detail here, but for now I'll concentrate on the parameters at the top of the window. At the top is the gradient slider. The two control points under the slider determine where the gradient starts and finishes. The diamond shaped control point at the top of the slider determines where the gradient midpoint occurs on the display. The next line contains information about the colour at the selected gradient control point. The colour box allows that colour to be changed. Clicking on that box opens up a colour swatch where a colour can be chosen to replace the selected colour. The next three numbers correspond to the RGB values of the selected colour. If you're confident using RGB values, you can enter appropriate values here to change the selected colour. The final button, when clicked, displays a pipette. You can use this pipette to change the selected colour by selecting any colour from the UI. The three sliders underneath the colour controls are used to modify the gradient. The first slider controls the alpha channel value of the selected colour. Adjusting this slider determines how transparent the colour is. 
A value of 0 will make the colour fully transparent. A value of 255 will make the colour fully opaque. The second slider provides a way of changing the active gradient range. The third slider provides an alternative way of positioning the midpoint control point. The next parameter has a drop down list. The list contains six options, but I'll only deal with two of these in this tutorial. First in the list and the default option is linear. This creates a gradient from one side of the display to the other. The orientation of the gradient can be changed, but I'll deal with this shortly. Radial is the second option in the list. This creates a circular gradient where the colour determined by the control point number 1 on the gradient slider is at the centre of the display. The gradient radiates outwards until the edge of the display where the colour is that of control point 2. Directly underneath the gradient type drop down are options that are contextual. They change depending upon the type of gradient selected. For instance, with radial selected, two sliders are displayed. These sliders determine the position of the radial gradient and the default values are 50, which is the centre of the display. The button at the side will return the values to the centre. If I change the type back to linear, the option displayed will change to an angle control. Adjusting this will change the direction of the gradient. Although, as you can see, the composite display doesn't update automatically. You need to either enter another value, press the return key, or click off the angle control. So, as you've seen, there's a lot going on, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I hope I've given you enough detail for you to get started with the advanced UI. Be assured there's a lot more to come. I'm not sure at the moment what I'll be concentrating on in the next tutorial. I may deal with spline object creation and manipulation. I'm trying to structure the episodes so they progress from relatively easy to difficult, so we'll have to see. Meanwhile, try playing around with the many options in the UI. It's amazing what you can find, although be prepared to be frustrated from time to time. As always, thanks for watching. Until the next time, bye for now.